Through the ages, man has been motivated to a degree by the fear of death. However, I find that few really want to study about it or seriously discuss it. Even when it stares them in the face, it's close to them through family members or friends, or themselves, their personal thing. But it's around us. It's all the time around us. We've never been far from it, from our birth on. Most people seem unwilling to think, and I underscore the word think, about their own death. It's always somebody else, some other time. The facts there, they know they're going to die, but they don't want to talk about it. Sort of like the song we just finished, Are You Ready for the Judgment Day? Well, we who live by the Bible have, and have been associated with the church and gospel preaching most of our lives, uh, we're as familiar with the day of judgment to come as about anything, and yet many people don't want to realize that. Hebrews 9.27 talks about both of them. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. The things that we say about death and the way that we react to it often realize the need for some basic changes in our mindsets about it. Unless the Lord returns first, we must. You can't dodge it. We must die. Each one of us. So in this sermon, I want us to study for a little while the three Three deaths with which we all must deal. The three deaths that we must face. First of all, physical death. Now you may find that this uh, repeats some of what we're studying about Adam and in the beginning in Genesis and Wednesday night. But some of it will be added to it and embellish it even further. But that's a direct result, that is physical death, direct result of man's disobedience to God in the Garden of Eden. Remember that everything which God had made, according to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, everything which he made was very good. Of course, that included man. Man who was made in the image of God, Genesis 1:26 through 27. That means his spiritual and moral image. Then, of course, we learned that God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And they had access to the fruit of all of the trees, but one. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. I've often wondered about that. Here's both of these people, the only two on the earth, husband and wife, Adam and Eve, in perfect sinlessness. They know nothing about sin. There's no sin in the world, no consequences of sin. Nothing like we live in today. So what did it mean to them when God says, when you eat of this certain tree, you'll die? What do they think about death? What do they understand about it? Now this, of course, is the first mention of death in the Bible. 
And Moses' accounts of the sins of Adam and Eve in the garden, I think, are familiar to all of us, Genesis 3, 1 through 8. And, of course, then there are the consequences of their sins. And we don't, I doubt, understand completely what happened to them when they violated God's law as far as their internal thinking. They realized they were naked. They knew that in that state they didn't want to be seen by God. They saw a need to cover themselves from before they had not Radical, radical, radical change that I don't grasp, really. But I don't have to grasp it and fully understand it to accept the fact of it. The shame came with the sin. That ought to tell us something. So he drove the, the man, drove out the man, that is, out of the garden. And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim, and the flame of a sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Genesis 3.24. Well, I'm curious about a lot of that. When did the Garden of Eden cease to exist? When did this very thing that he describes here stop? Don't know. Doesn't affect us and our service to God now. But notice because of sin, the transgression of God's law. Man is barred from the tree of life. And death becomes a reality in the human family. Other factors associated with death enter into the fact that Adam and Eve sinned. To the woman God said, I will greatly multiply thy pain in, thy, in the conception. In pain thou shalt bring forth children. To the man he said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and into dust shalt thou return. Genesis 3, 16 through 19. Again, in their minds, I don't know what went on. But as soon as they broke God's Law, they were immediately dead to God, separated from God. They didn't have what they had with Him before. I may not understand completely the fellowship they had with Him when they were sinless, but they lost it. They had a different viewpoint. Fear came upon them. Shame came upon them. They weren't prepared to handle that. Much later... The inspired apostle wrote these words. Therefore, as through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Romans 5 verse 12. Thus, because of the sin in Eden, physical death is in this world. Because we've all sinned. So we live with it. But isn't it amazing how you can blind yourself to it? How you can realize you have one opportunity to go through this life in this physical body. And you don't know how long it's going to last. To prove to God you love him or you don't. That you have faith in his gospel system or you do not. One time. There are a host of people today who, in their next birthday, if they live, will be 20. They'll never see it. They'll never see the 25th birthday, the 30th birthday, whatever. But there is a birthday coming for all of us we will not see. We're going to be here. We'll be dead. And we see what we're talking about on every hand that is the inevitability of physical death. David, King David, near the close of his life, told his son this. I'm going the way of all the earth. 1 Kings 2 and verse 2. 
very simple statement, but how powerful it, it is. It should be a motivator. Because you see, every one of us sitting here today, as well as everybody in this world, are going the way of all the earth. We just don't know when we're going to get to the end of it. And earlier in his life, uh, David had written, What man is he that shall live and not see death? Psalm 89, verse 48. Well, that's true with us today, isn't it? The living know that they shall die. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5. And I've already quoted Hebrews 9, 27 in the New Testament. And as is appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. That reality is there. With every thought, with every breath we take, everything we do. Death is as sure as it can be. Nothing else can be more sure than that. For too many of us, however, the certainty of death burdens us down with anxiety because there's something lacking. We're like Adam and Eve. We're ashamed to appear before God. Something's wrong. We're not in fellowship with Him. That's part of that spirit within us that's the real us that will continue on when the body goes back to dust that will exist forever. It bears the image of the Father of God and it causes us to think about eternity. Well, what then? God answers the wicked is thrust down in his evil doing. But the righteous hath a refuge in his death. Proverbs 14, 32. Well, I like that passage. People unprepared to meet their God. People still guilty of their sin. People who still worry and are burdened down, anxious, and all of that goes along with a people burdened with the guilt of sin. Uh, they don't have the hope that is in the latter part of Proverbs 40, 14, 32. But the righteous hath a refuge in his death. See, death takes on a different picture to the person that serves God. It's not a time of coming before God unprepared. A God who is, the writer of Hebrews said, a consuming fire. Or it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But here is a view that changes about death. It becomes a doorway, a refuge in his death. He's freed from all of the turmoil of this life that's dominated by Satan and sin and all those who live in sin. Thus Psalm 116 and verse 15 reads, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now put those two verses together. The righteous hath a refuge in his death, and precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Well, to me, that tells me, as a Christian, one who labors to walk the straight and narrow way, to serve God according to his will, when one of my brethren dies, as much as a human can know about anybody else, well, we're thankful. We're thankful because the righteous hath a refuge in his death. And the death of a saint is precious in God's sight. You finished the course, as Paul said. You've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up as it was for Saul, Paul, a crown of righteousness for all of us. So when Christ directs the life, when our faith is in him and we're obedient, physical death can actually become a refuge. But I doubt most people think of it that way. But children of God ought to. 
when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, we recognize there was more than physical death, I've already alluded to it actually, that resulted. There are some that would argue they did not die in the day they sinned, but that they only started the death process, that that would take years for it to come. And I find nothing in the Bible teaching to such things as that. They died immediately spiritually and that they were immediately separated from God spiritually. Then they began to die physically when they were cast out of the garden because they could not partake of that which kept them physically alive forevermore, the tree of life. God said plainly they would die when they partook of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. In Eden, before they sinned, there was great communion with God. Again, I, I don't mind saying, although I wish I knew more and understood about it, what it was like to be a full-grown adult and be sinless like a babe. But they were they had only one divine positive law that was right for one reason only. God said so, and that tested their love of him and their faith in him. And they violated it. And God drove them out, Genesis 3, 24. Thus they're separated from God. And just as their physical death is the result of the separation of the body and the spirit, so James declares is his definition of death, the body apart from the spirit is dead, James 2, verse 26, and Ecclesiastes 20, or 12, 7. So spiritual death is the result of separation from God. Now all people who are responsible to God, who are accountable to God for their actions, have suffered that one death that's separated from God. They need to be reconciled to God. They need to have their sins forgiven, that they can be justified in His sight. God has that plan. But concerning sin, the great Old Testament prophet later wrote, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you. Isaiah 59 2. It's what happened with Adam and Eve and everybody else that's ever sinned. And that would be all people. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they died. Sin separated them from God. And cut off after having been booted out of the Garden of Eden from the tree of life, they began to die physically. I think that man's plight is very graphically described in Isaiah chapter 53. When the great prophet wrote, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. That sums it up. I can't blame it on anybody for my sins. People may have had a part in my sins, but when all is said and done, I sinned. The result, ye are separate from Christ. According to Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, 12, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now that's the state of most of the people that are accountable to God on this earth today. Why? All because of sin. But earlier in this same chapter, God declares, you hath he made alive, who were, that's a past tense, you know, used to be, not anymore, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Then a little later he says, even when we were dead in sins, hath made us alive together with Christ, verses 1 and 5. So there is that forgiveness of sins available. There is that being justified in God's sight, being reconciled to God, to be back in fellowship with God. To those who neglect the Lord that died for them, 
while living for this world, for time and space. Here's what the apostle wrote. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, 1 Timothy 5, 6. That means you're separated from God, though you may have all kinds of money and wealth and blessings. You're still separated from God. You're still dead in your trespasses and sins. Because all have sinned, Romans 3.23. And therefore, spiritual death is a problem that we must all face. That's what's happening to this generation in America. They don't have that disposition of mind. They're not thinking about death, that they're separated from God, that they're cut off from God. They have no promise of eternal life. Death is not a, a refuge. It's only the doorway into misery. Think of that rich man in the account of rich man to Lazarus in Luke 16. He had all that a man would want for that day and time. But it just says that he died and was buried and lifted up his eyes in torment. So he made a great transition. From that which was sumptuous and living in the best that a person could then, in the blink of an eye, or maybe we should say in a heartbeat, he was removed to a place he never gave any thought of. But Christ came to give us life. The whole New Testament abounds with that message. That's the gospel message. I think of John 11, 25 through 26, specifically talking about Christ came to give us life. And we just sang about the great physician nigh near the sympathizing Jesus. He bids the drooping heart to cheer, oh, hear the voice of Jesus. So our transition from life to death ought to concern everybody. In Colossians 2, 12 and 13, buried with Christ in baptism, wherein you're also raised with him through faith in the operation or working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, you, Paul says, I say, did he make alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Imagine, all of it's erased. There's no anxieties. You're Heavenly Father now. Through Jesus, you can approach Him and He'll hear you and He's promised to answer every prayer to guide you providentially as you labor to follow the truth of the gospel of Christ. So we have that spiritual death. And right here in this room today, people are either in spiritual life with Christ are they in a state of spiritual death, separated from God? There's no in-between. But then there comes what we see is the second death. Now John, the apostle, is exhorting Christians to faithfulness. And in exhorting them to faithfulness, he reveals the promise, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Revelation 2.11 And then when you get over to chapter 20 and verse number 6, the term is used again. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death hath no power. Well, the second death is defined in Revelation 20 and verse 14. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. There wouldn't be a Hadean world if death did not exist, and thus there is that temporary dwelling place of spirits without bodies where we go when we die. It's where the rich man went in torments, separated by a great gulf from paradise where Abraham and Lazarus were, and where Jesus and the thief went when they died, when they were crucified. All of this works because God knows exactly when he's going to bring this whole system to an end in our future. 
maybe the next second, maybe a thousand years. No one knows, but he does. We do know that time continues, 2 Peter 3, 9, to give men an opportunity to repent and obey the truth. But this second death is also described as the lake of fire. Lake of fire and brimstone. That's where Satan's going to be cast by God for eternity, according to verse 10. So I think it's quite evident that this lake of fire, which is the second death, is that eternal punishment from which no person who enters it will ever leave. I try from time to time, because how terrible hell is and trying to grasp it, just to think about being there and never leaving. Because your mind in this life, when something bad's going on, you think, well, I'll get over this. I'll get Even the faithful child of God, see, death becomes a door into peace. But the person separated from God, who's dead to God, dead in trespasses and sins, when that person dies, it's just misery beyond my mind to grasp. And it never changes. It's on and on. And your mind keeps wanting to say, well, yes, but it'll end. But it won't end. Now, thinking people ought to realize that means we better take advantage of the time we have. For the time God's giving us is because He loves us. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I remember one time many years ago, I'd been asked to come into southwest Arkansas to to work with a congregation where I knew the preacher in a vacation Bible school. And this goes back a long time ago now. And, um, of course, I had the assignment not only of teaching in class, but also leading the singing for the little ones. That's how long I've <laughs> been singing some of those songs. But while we were there, a young man in his 20s, I think about that age, not a whole lot older, was killed. He had been a member of the church, but he had been out of duty, wasn't faithful, killed in a car wreck. And they had the funeral that week at the church building. And they asked several of us to, is the custom still is in lots of places, to sing. And we were off over in a classroom like this. And the preacher, as I said, I knew he preached the funeral. But then we were over here, the rest of us singing. And there was quite a crowd. It was a very big crowd. Everybody knew these people. And some time I've ever seen this, and it was something you never forget. And it was because that parent had not done all that they knew they could have done and should have done. And certainly the young person that was dead had not done what they should have done. And when they came to filing by the casket, as the custom is, the father was so distraught, so beside himself, he would back up and just run toward the casket and to stop him from lifting up the body. It was just awful. Question, does that sound like somebody that knew they were pleasing to God and their son was pleasing to God, or are they lamenting everything because it's over and done with and there is no hope for that child? Well, that's not just some fantasy story. I witnessed that. It's not just a preacher story, but it's one that happened. And over the years, it hasn't been a pleasant thing at times to be in funerals when the person was not prepared to meet their God. Families who were stood around and all they could do was hold one another because they couldn't very well pray for that dead one. That person's time on earth and time to change is over and done with. 
and that they would think honestly in the light of the truth, they would know at that moment that person is in torment, having rejected God's salvation in the gospel, and nobody, nobody, nobody can do a thing in the world about it because they didn't when they could. So it's evident that this lake of fire, which is the second death, is that eternal punishment about which Jesus spoke. And in teaching about the judgment, the Lord said that the wicked would be separated from the righteous. Well, for the one who lives his life here, fighting the fight of faith, trying to be like Jesus, obeying the Lord, not letting the world run his business, that's a relief. This world is wicked because there are wicked people, and people are wicked because they live on the level of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, of pride of life, and they do as they please, and they don't think of God. If they do think of God, it's through erroneous doctrines that are no better than just simply to cause one to believe wrong things. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Then the scripture says of them, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Everlasting punishment. No end to it. Why? Because they spurned the love of God. They spurned the grace of God. They spurned the mercy of God. They spurn their parents trying to get them to obey the gospel and their family urging them to be faithful. They spurn friends trying to teach them the truth and to get them to see the worth of life, live for the Lord. They refuse to walk the only way, the straight and narrow way of righteousness that leads to heaven. And they chose to trust in themselves. I said last week, my prayer for people like that is that before they pillow their head at night, if God allows them to get to that night, that they will worry themselves sick till they obey the truth. In similar teaching in chapter 9 of the book of Mark, Jesus describes that terrible place of punishment as hellfire, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now, you think of having to spend just one day in that. And you walk out there and go sit right outside now, if it is 107, which they predicted, just out there and just sit in the sun for 30 minutes and see how you feel. Brother Marshall Keeble used to talk about people in hell. He said they would just love to come back and take a bath in lava so they could cool off. Well, that's not trying to make light of things. That's trying to get over the point. There's nothing in this world that's really comparable to the torments of the lake of fire and brimstone, which is a second death. These things are in the Bible to make us realize it is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God, a perfectly just God who through his mercy and his grace and the gospel system has offered salvation and lets time go on and just keeps going on to give men time to obey the truth. We may not like to think of death. A lot of people don't. Especially do we dislike thinking of the second death. But we would not be what we ought to be if we didn't. I don't know how a person who serves God faithfully can't think of these things. God has set it up to be that way. Jesus, in fact, through the Holy Spirit, by the Apostle Paul, said to the Thessalonians, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's righteous to do that. That is the fulfillment of his justice. But also it says, who shall come to be admired in all the saints. All have sinned. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 3.23 and 6.23. 
So while the second death is ultimate conclusion to the evil, to all evil, God offers life through Christ. There's no reason for us not to think of the life that Christ offers us now. He offers us peace, come unto me all you that labor are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall rest under your souls. Only those who reject the love of God and persist in rebellion against His grace that's offered in Christ through the gospel will experience eternal punishment in the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, physical death for most of us, well, it cannot be avoided. Even if we're alive when the Lord comes back, I tell you, there'll be a great transition either way it goes. But most of us will die. It is appointed that the men wants to die. We fail ourselves when we dwell with anxiety on the darkness of the grave. For death is certain. But the spiritual life which Christ gives offers triumph of faith. It brings eternal victory. I won't try to do this, but read 1 Corinthians 15 and read all about the resurrection. You know, I have to go into the graveyard, but there's somebody that can get me out. And in the resurrection, the righteous shall rise. In a body fitted for eternity, even as our Lord has, John says we do not know what we shall be like but we shall be like him. The last enemy that shall be abolished is death, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. That'll be done when all the dead are resurrected. These are the children of obedience, Mark 16, 16, and 1 Peter 1, 14. This enables the faithful to face death, as we started out earlier saying, is simply a step into peace and happiness. I suppose one of the greatest comforts I've had thus far in life, I know not what it will be like in the future, was when my daddy was dying. And he was but a second or so away from death. I, I don't know exactly the situation, but I did know that sometimes when people are dying, they can still hear you very well, I'm told. Hearing is one of the last things to go. And they told us what to look for in the process of death that comes upon all. And so I, I talked to Daddy when, his, when he was breathing his last. I said, Daddy, you serve Christ all your life. Now I'll reach up and take the hand that Christ offers you and go on home and be at peace. I can't say that to everybody or about everybody. But I decided a long time ago as a teenager that I was going to do my best to plead and beg and teach the truth and oppose error to get people to obey the precious gospel of Christ and take the hand of Christ and let him lead you home. So we labor and we work, knowing who will reward our labors, our Lord himself, who's already blazed the trail and will someday say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Are you subject to the gospel invitation? As a Christian, are you faithful? If not, now is the time to make the difference and show God you love him and you have faith in his system and resolve you're going to walk the straight and narrow way till time is no more and heaven's your home. If you're subject to the call of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.